Good morning. Happy St. Patty's Day. Happy St. Patty's Day. Good morning, everybody. This is what happy, happy Wednesday already. I don't even know what week we're on anymore. All right, guys, we're just moving a couple things here and we're going to get started. Thank you for joining us this morning. Um, a little technical things. Uh, I think it's a, a daily ritual. I have some kind of technical issue with technology, so um, we're looking good. Let me get my. All right, awesome. So welcome to advanced wiring and controls. Kind of threw that in the last second. Applications training. Um, you got myself, Rick Costner, and the man behind the scenes today. It's Anthony Tassi. He will be answering. Any questions you want to throw at us, you got a chat box. You also have um, a little handout section there. Uh, we're working on throwing on a couple other things in there. Right now we got a line sheet in there. Um, this is what you you will see. We're going to throw in the, the all new or the latest and greatest Takeo wiring guide. Uh, we're also going to throw in there, I sent Anthony, um, we have a little updated sheet that can be added to this with the uh, nest or third party, I guess you can call learning or power robbing thermostats. Uh, we got some new additions we can throw in there, a couple of sheets. So a little bonus we can throw in there for you. Uh, the line sheet, as you can see in the center here, show you all of our great manufacturers that we're representing today. On the back side, if we flip it over, you're going to find our contract services group. So it's myself and Anthony, along with Jim, John and Rob on the New Jersey side. Kind of working with you guys, uh, obviously putting together these trainings every week. So we're going to have some fun today. This isn't a terribly long, should be wrapping up right around 8 o'clock with your questions. So throw them out there. You can also throw in your little chat, you know, that you can give us a thumbs up. You can hear us loud and clear before we get 30 minutes into this and find out you can't hear us. So um, I love got to hear from you guys. Say that again, Ant. I said I have you nice and loud, so it's good, good. good so far. Thank you, Perfect. Keith. A couple of guys are chiming in, so. Yep, I see that. Thanks, Keith. Edward. Perfect, perfect. Awesome, guys. So let's kick this off. So the main purpose of this advanced wiring, I know a lot of you guys have joined us for our understanding low voltage wiring. Um, a couple of guys have reached out, you know, looking for a couple more topics, some hydroware stuff, and, and, you know, just trying to advance it a little bit. So, you know, that's what this purpose, uh, the main purpose of this training was, was just to make you feel more comfortable when approaching different strategies or different control strategies and, and just open your mind to be more creative. You know, I love electric. I love controls. I love wiring. The more wires, the more, you know, engaged I am. I, I love trying to figure out what everything does. You know, but sometimes, you know, we don't just, we don't utilize these controls to what their potential is. So hopefully today, You'll see some crazy stuff. Some of you guys might have a headache when we leave here. Some of the stuff we're going to play around with. But uh, for others, maybe you open your mind a little bit and we start utilizing some controls in ways we weren't using before. So our topics for today, again, we're going to go through the relay review. Just I love understanding what a relay does and then really you can see the potential of what it can be. Um, and we're going to go through some, you know, using low voltage for line voltage applications. I mean, we do that every day. Um, we'll go through some of those um, ways that we do, some of the ways we used to, and, and maybe some better ways that we can. Um, then another, the two big topics that I really like to cover was the dual fuel application that seems to be coming more and more uh, common today. You know, we'll go through why and, and what are some of those dual fuel applications, and of course, hydroware. That was a this was a big one. A lot of guys have reached out and asked about it. You know, there's not a lot we can go through, but maybe some what it was and more some maybe some more efficient ways to run a hydroware system. So we'll have some fun with that. So kicking it off with the relay review. Again, nothing too complicated. You guys have seen relays, you deal with relays every single day. The most common relays you guys have seen from us in the Takeo world have been now our SR relays, our switching relays. On the top left there, we got the ZBC controls for our zone valves. So you guys have seen that before. Some guys still like to wire them by themselves without a relay, that's fine. Still working with end switches there in the zone valves. So some common parts. Uh, we got this little guy here we're gonna talk about later, the HAFC, which is our hydroware fan control. Uh, I think that's something that, 
you know, it's almost like our, we do the hydronics class. It's like our I-series valve, you know, it's a, it's a great product. We don't see a lot of out there. You know, I think this thing has a lot of great features, which we'll, we'll take a quick look at uh, later on today. But, you know, we look at what makes up a relay, you know, coils and contacts and all kinds of stuff. You know, a lot of these other products like our leak breaker, you can see in the bottom left here, I got the laser on, you got some contacts there, you know, what, what can we do with them? You know, we can pretty much do anything we want as long as we play friendly with the ratings of those contacts. You know, even our circulators today, they got new E-series, a lot of these uh, larger ones and some of the residential, we might have contacts in there that we can control something else. And as well as our low water cutoff, it's something everybody's been using. So we got some contacts in there, being able to do different things, turn things on and off, most likely a burner if we didn't have the water in the boiler. So, you know, understanding how a contact works really doesn't just limit it to what we say it's gonna be. Um, we can really extend or be more flexible and, and use it for other sources. Uh, thanks, Ed, for throwing that in the handout. So you guys have all of that now, I just saw that. So you got the wiring guide, the nest applications. So that's, that's a new stuff in there. And not oh, line sheet, perfect. So what makes up a relay, or I should say, uh, yeah, a relay itself. So I, I like this view. This is a nice exploded view of the coil itself, right? So we energize this coil, creates a magnetism. We pull in on this pivot arm here. We pull in this little magnetic flux, you know, pull that in there. And what happens? You know, well, we take a set of contacts over here. We got a normally open and a normally closed. We take this little rod movable contact and we push it over. So when we energize this, we open or break one set of contacts and we close another. What's hooked up to those, it's endless. It really is endless to what we can do. Now, some relays, as we know, we've got the coil. That coil can be made of multiple voltages. So we'll take a look at that in a second. But the contacts themselves, we have many configurations. So if you're not familiar with the uh, acronyms here, or the, the single pole, single throw, normally open right so that switch is normally open if i powered a coil that would close um, we got the opposite now normally close which will open so maybe we want to turn something off when we energize a coil and then we can do double double pole single throw so like a 220 switch light switch that's got two poles two power sources coming in going to load and then with a single throw we can turn that off or we can turn it on regardless depending on what we want so we got a bunch of different configurations and and depending on what we have in our hand we can utilize that you know maybe to do some pretty cool stuff so some of the most common relays we've seen then and now i guess you can say is some of us you know i, I love the ice cube relays you know some of us on here i don't know might not have ever seen the ice cube relay but you know, I love that thing. I used to keep two or three of them on my truck, you know, just to get me out of trouble. I was a night service guy, you know, so I would utilize these, you know, in situations where I had maybe a bad fan relay in a, in a furnace, you know, anything, anything that had a relay on it, a couple spade connections and then wires, you know, make some crimps there and we can uh, throw that on anything pretty much, you know, and now the new, the rib relay. I mean, I was looking on their product offering and it's endless. I mean, these guys have make hundreds of different configurations, so it gets a little confusing as to what model number and, and what wholesalers are stock and what. But you know, when we look up close on a rib relay, and I think the biggest selling point for this for me was it's got an LED, right? They get you put a light on anything, and I'm sold. So I'd like to know when things are on and off, and kind of get a little lazy there. But we got circulators now with LEDs, and th that was the coolest feature for me. Um. But if we look, you know, we can look at the schematic here. What's my laser? Hold give me a sec. Here we go. So we look at the schematic here. You know, it tells us a lot. So we got two coils in this uh, relay. We got two, you know, a couple different voltages we can apply to that coil. And then we have two sets of contacts here between our yellow and blue. We got a normally closed contact. So when we power that coil, it's going to open. And the opposite here, yellow and orange will be normally open. We'll close when we energize that relay. And if we look to the left, you're going to find where we can play and where we can, right? So coil input ratings, you know, we this is a real flexible relay in my eyes. I can go 10 to 30 volts DC. I can go 10 to 30 volts AC, or I can do 120 volts AC. And then I got to be within these um, amperage ratings and stuff like that, milliamps. So, you know, 
if I'm using any one of these, and, and I'm going to kind of show you a couple different applications where Rib Relay, you know, has been used in, in a couple of design uh, strategies, but, you know, I can do anything with this. The DC, AC, it's just a matter of picking the wire I want, white and blue and my common, or well, white and black, my common, pick one. And then from there, the contacts have their own ratings. So again, 10 amp resistance, you know, 207, up to 277 volts or 28 volts DC. So depending on what I'm looking to do, you can see here, you know, these things are used for lighting. So if we got some ballasts or a tungsten bulb, you know, it's a type of incandescent bulb, like a vacuum seal bulb. So depending on what we're trying to do with it, you know, maybe hook up a motor, you know, we just want to check the amperage rater, what the uh, amperage rating of that motor, and we should be good to go as long as we fit into here. You know, we, me and Anthony, we were talking the other day about these rib relays. Uh, I was working with a guy who had one of these relays. He didn't even need voltage to operate the coil. It was uh, dry contacts. So that was, that's what would drive those contacts closed on the other side of the relay, excuse me. So I think these things can be used pretty much everywhere. And again, you put a light on them, you got me. So how do we control relays? You know, we know the most common, the thermostats and right? switches. So we can have something close, you know, as an output and turn that relay on. Sensors, signals, right? So the signals is more popular now. We're getting into that world. That's where I said most, some guys might have a headache after we leave here today, but we got our common light switch. We got the thermostat. We got a flow switch here. So we'll look at that a little bit more sensor right so we can get some uh, information or maybe based on temperature air or water we can drive a relay closed and that brings us to you know different medias right we can have water air or manually you know just turning something on and off you know just to kind of expand on on what switches are out there that we see in daily you know we go into the steam world we all worked with a pressure troll this was my favorite one with the mercury right Used to have fun playing with that stuff. I guess we're not allowed to do that anymore. But uh, mercury was always fun. So this guy would build up some pressure. You'd watch that bulb kind of tilt itself, and the mercury would leave the the metal contacts on this side. It would slide down the bulb, and you know that would allow would basically cut off my burner, so we didn't produce any more steam pressure, right? So you know, that was in the steam world. Water and refrigerant. We've seen high and low pressure switches. You know, it might be good for feeding a boiler or something like that and some of these wall hung boilers, but you got pressure switches that look like that. Air switches, you know, all our water heaters today, our condensing water heaters are coming with these, tankless water heaters, some of the wall hung boilers. We got to prove a fan's running before we ignite. So that, that's a, a big part. Uh, and what else we got here? And the flow switch, you know, like I said in the beginning. So flow switches are something that we do see time and time again. Um, maybe we want to prove, we want to prove that we have, you know, flow before that burner fires up. So we can utilize that. Just open your mind a little bit and think of where else you could use it, right? Because that's pretty much endless. And sensors, you know, th this is something we see in a Fujitsu world. I mean, we got the misters like crazy, you know, there's all kinds of sensors reading information, you know, from that info, it could just give input to a board that'll end up opening or closing that relay or just providing data. So something else can open a relay or close it. You know, obviously we turn things on and off and we also protect, you know, if you haven't seen one of these guys is a freeze stat, you know, if I want to put this on a coil and an air handler and God forbid I get close to freezing temperatures below 32, we can shut off a condenser or maybe turn a pump on so we don't freeze up a, a pipe, whatever the case is. You know, we've got different methods when we talk about sensors. So this was something, I'm gonna start with a couple applications here. This is stuff that I think we've seen before, you know, if you're into research, you're into plumbing, you know, everybody wants their research in the common way it was always a timer or an aquastat or something where wasn't the most efficient. So Takeo came out with a smart plug, which was awesome. It's got a sensor that senses the customer's, you know, usage and kind of turns that pump on and off depending on their, their demand. And then we always had that motion switch that we've seen here where we could hook up. And when our customer's in the bathroom, the pump's on, you know, immediately. So using signals now, you know, and this is something we're playing around with, you know, might not be perfect application, but trying to open my mind here a little bit. So 
I put a green X here because I love the smart plug. I didn't put a red X there, I'm trying to be nice. But let's say we get rid of that smart plug and we introduce something. Some of you guys might have heard of this before, some might not. But this is something called a Wemo switch. It's a Wi-Fi switch, Wi-Fi enabled, right? So, you know, I can now control this system with a Wi-Fi switch. I plug my pump into it. My customer has an app that they can program so they can set a time schedule and this pump will come on and off with a Wi-Fi signal, you know, whenever they want by an app. You know, they want the motion, great. You know, they do provide motion sensors, you know, so we can still give them what they want maybe even a little bit more. They want to interact with it. They have fun with it. Great. You know, we give them recirc, make it a little less complicated for you. It's all Wi-Fi at that point. So again, it's just to open up your eyes, maybe think of some other applications, have fun with it, do it in your own house, make sure it works first. I'm just kidding. Um, but no, it's a Wi-Fi switch. Very simple. We use them a lot. We use them for all types of different applications. And we can use them for more, honestly. You know, I think the products are just getting better. And if we were aware of what's out there, we could really make some maybe complicated uh, systems a little bit more simpler just by adding something like this. So when we talk about signals, I mean, you guys have all seen Amazon Alexa and all of this stuff. We can now talk. We can set a voice signal now, tell something what to do. Maybe that's a, an app which will turn on my Fujitsu. Maybe it's an app that'll turn on, you know, pretty much anything today. You know I mean? Anthony joke around. I, I know we did a class, so I'm trying to remember what we did, but we used to throw a slide on there. I think it was my Wi-Fi class, you know, what's not Wi-Fi today? You know, what's not, you know, what doesn't have an app? So we have different things, you know, this can be a voice driven thing. You know, I can tell my TV what channel to go on. So I can pretty much win our world of hydronics and air conditioning and plumbing and everything else everything plays nicely we even have apps that talk to each other so you don't even have to do anything you set them up you know we see this a lot in the Fujitsu world this is actually a, a integrated control we'll look at in a minute too but I can have a weather app and give it a, a, a uh, and if this we call this if this then that so if this if it drops below 40 degrees out it's going to talk to this little app IFTTT which is going to send a signal to my Wi-Fi switch which I might have a pump hooked up to, right? So if it's less than 40 degrees, one app tells another app to turn a switch on, or basically turn this switch on, and maybe that's hooked up to my snowmelt system. You know, when we look at all these sophisticated controls and all of this stuff that monitors temperature and humidity, and I think that's the best way to do things sometimes is the humidity and temperature, but you know what, it's my house, I wanna put a Wi-Fi switch hooked up to my pump. You know, if I got one single pump, then great. Here we go. You know, less than 40 degrees, I don't have to do anything. All the apps are gonna talk and do it on their own. I wake up and as long as there's no snow on that driveway, I'm happy. So again, it can be endless. We can have anything hooked up to it. It's just a matter of communication and signals. Um, this was a cool thing that, you know, first boiler I've, I've been able to work with here, the NTI boilers, where they have onboard Wi-Fi. You know, so what that does is everybody's used outdoor reset sensors. Well, in this setup, if I hook up my onboard Wi-Fi and I hook it up to the homeowner's network, you know, I can go in and change it. They geofence, so based on my location and the address of where I'm at, it's going to utilize the weather in that area, not the outdoor sensor. So I don't have to run a wire. You know, maybe that saves me some time. Maybe I don't have to worry about the sun and everything else and the positioning of that sensor. I'm always going to get great weather detail, you know, as long as we have Wi-Fi right to it, you know. So we have a network, the NTI network, where we can set all that up. You know, we don't have to touch this boiler. Imagine not having to send a tech to a job, just going on your dashboard and controlling the boiler, sending signals from, you know, 300 miles away, wherever you are. You don't even have to do anything. You don't have to roll a truck. Probably one of the coolest things. I tried to get a slide up there, Ant, but it was getting late last night <laughs> as far as the network. So. You know, using low voltage for line voltage applications, you know, what does that look like? I think for many of us that started, this was the early versions. This was our fan center. This was a transformer, it's more than a transformer and a uh, multi-purpose relay there. So we had a coil in that relay, some contacts. We had our power source right here, right to our low voltage. So what we do with the low voltage? You know, we were pretty much driving a blower, you know, a single speed or multi-speed 
excuse me, PSC or fan driven motor, whatever the case was, so belt driven. So if we look at what this relay is to the left, we can identify it on a schematic here, you know, just start to identify the parts and pieces like we showed before, the normally open and normally closed contacts. You know, what are they doing? You know, we're not gonna go nuts and go through this whole schematic, but you know, in this case, we're just we got a power source coming in. Here's our coil up here. You can see our R, G, W, Y, and C that we see up in the face here. Send 24 out, uh, volts out, come back and power up. Could be anything. We close a relay and open another. Just changing fan speeds. Maybe the difference between heating and cooling fan speeds. You know, so, you know, it was pretty simple. You know, I think you, this was another little piece that you can utilize for anything. You know, you want to control something low voltage. Doesn't have to be attached to a furnace. You know, this could go anywhere you need it to go. You know, I threw this in here because, like I said, possibilities open your eyes a little bit. You know, we get a little, you know, I don't want to say complicated, but some of these controls out here, I met most of the guys I worked with, when they saw this blue box on a wall, they were done. They were out of that boiler room. You know, call somebody else. I don't know what to do. You know, there's so much going on, wires going all over. But in all honesty, when you looked at the control, we weren't utilizing this for half of its potential, you know, half of what it can do. You know, if we're, we're dealing with multiple stages of boilers or something like that, and there's only one boiler there or two boilers there, and this thing can do so much more. You know, we look at it a little closer, we have a bunch of inputs. You know, typically you'd find one input, you know, when it was a heat call from a zone relay. So that was your one input. And then you went to one boiler, maybe two, you know, but we got pump outputs. Well, the boilers today, a lot of them come with boiler pumps. So do I need that? primary pump output so there's something else that's not getting utilized you know what can i use that terminal for now it's an output 120 volts maybe maybe i want to put a fresh air system in right it doesn't say fresh air anywhere up here it doesn't give me those icons but just because it doesn't have the icon doesn't mean we can't use it you know if this is sending out 120 volts as long as the we're not exceeding the amp ratings of these terminals you know maybe i got a fan in a can there Bring in some fresh air. Same thing over here. You know, maybe my second stage is not a boiler. Maybe it's my second stage is something else. Maybe it's electric heat. Maybe it's a high, uh, heat pump. You know, really doesn't make a difference. The control doesn't know any better. You know, we're smarter than the control. Believe it or not, we can do whatever we want with it if we just understand how the relays work and how the signals are being sent out. Um, you know, if I look here and I'm using a modulating boiler. I might not have anything hooked up here. So I just opened up two relays that I could potentially use for something else, maybe another circulator, maybe another heating system, maybe an air conditioning system, maybe a light bulb, maybe, you know, whatever, you know, it could be whatever you want it to be. So I think if we understand and we look at some of these controls a little bit closer, I'm going to look at some other examples here. And again, I threw this in here, the rib again, because if I exceed my maybe my amperage limitations on the relays, you know, maybe my circulators I'm hooking up are a little bit larger, they exceed my amperage ratings. Well, maybe I put a rib relay on there, put something else that can handle it, you know, so now that those dry contacts will close my rib relay, which now energize my circulator. So it's always, always something we can do, always a possibility. You know, in a world of Fujitsu, we're just seeing more and more of this where they're giving us more and more inputs and outputs that we can kind of utilize. You know, I don't know what else we can hook up to these things at this point because it seems like it's endless. But, you know, we got this, the new air handlers that we just rolled out, our multi-positional air handlers, we got electric heaters in them, right? So we can add an electric heater. So we have a dedicated plug for that. Does that plug have to be for the electric heater? Not necessarily. We have other plugs we can use that'll give us some the same uh, potential. But you know, what if I plugged in? All it's doing, if we look at the schematic here, up in the top left, we're just energizing a coil, right? So when our remote control says, "Hey, use this o o external heater," it energizes this coil, closes a contact, and puts power to. You know, there's got to be a separate power source or something here. It'll energize that heater. Well, what if I, it's not an electric heater? What if it's a circulator, right? What if it's a circulator going to a hydro air? Right? Can we do that? We'll take a look in a little bit, a little teaser. Uh, we even have the ability to throw in another board, right? So if all those plugs and outputs on the board, on the primary board that came from the factory weren't enough, we can throw on another board. And if you look at the bottom here, we got three more sets of outputs, a set of inputs. 
So we can just, like I said, I, I don't know what we can't do with these things anymore. You know, adding humidifiers, ERVs, you know, whatever it is, you know, we can, uh, Anthony mentioned last night, we were kind of reviewing this, uh, maybe even a UV light. I, I don't know. It can be pretty much endless at this point. I probably said that 30 times. You know, another one, this is an awesome manufacturer that we like to work with, Space Pack. You know, these guys make their own boards, you know, and we look at air handlers today, like the one we were just looking at, that, you know, there's so many different possibilities on those boards that we just don't take advantage of. You know, we, we end up doing maybe something else. I, I see guys all the time that are going to maybe another manufacturer, adding another control because the customer wanted this. Well, we can do that, you know, and so in most cases, we can do that extra whatever it is that homeowner wants to do. You know, we just got to understand what our boards can really do. You know, we look here, we got some inputs here for our thermostat. We got some outputs, right? HVAC outputs. So maybe we got to send a signal to something else to allow, uh, let it know that we're running air conditioning or heating. We got some more over here, auxiliary terminals. So these are pretty much op wide open. What do we want to do with them? You can see here, I can throw a humidifier. We got some kind of fault there. So maybe I want to, maybe that's a light bulb that lets me know that something happened float switches ERVs humidistats you know the great thing about these guys up at space pack is they build their own boards so every time they want to add something or they get some input from you guys or us they'll add it in a heartbeat you know so it doesn't take long to see a change we got some sensors coming in here giving us some information on coil temperatures leaving air temp LAT we got a pressure pressure uh, point here so we can hook up a tube I'm not going to go into great detail on what this board can do but you know, utilizing some of these auxiliary outputs, maybe to turn other things on and off, you know, we have the ability here to kind of control that, you know, by pushing a couple buttons, my auxiliary one terminal, I can pick whether I want to have that close on heating, cooling, or both heating and cooling, and a fan will be constant pressure. So, you know, I've used this in an application, and I'll show you a little diagram of that in a little bit, but Again, this is something that we show up to a lot of these jobs and we have our basic R, G, Y1, maybe a W1 in some cases and a common. Other than that, half of this stuff is empty. You know, Do we need a lot of it? Maybe not, but maybe there's other things, like I said, that we're not thinking of or we're, we're using other controls for, You know, spending more money, another expense to do something that this board was more than capable of doing. So it becomes an understanding. All right, we're moving along. How are we doing with questions, Ant? I'm working on one right now. I, I mean, I can probably verbally give it if you want. Yeah, why not? Why question not? regarding the buffer tank to maintain temperature, right? When the when you have a small zone, uh, what would be the most efficient way to use that to reduce the boiler cycling, I guess, running? You know, using a tech mar to maintain temperature in a tank based upon outdoor temperature, disconnect those small zones from the boiler. And if I'm trying to read this three times now at, uh, you know, 7.28 a.m., um, <laughs> I'm trying to thinking in, in the world of the buff tanks, I would probably see an aquastat set the low side, maybe five, eight degrees below whatever my design delta T for the system is. Um Thermostats yeah, yeah. would call in the relay and move circulators if there's a heat call, and we don't necessarily have to fire the boiler. Right, right. Usually it's two different drawing, systems. You know, drawing down that tank, so I'm yeah. kind of playing in my mind an aquastat low side, a couple degrees lower than what maybe the system's delta T would be. So. Yeah, I got a nice in this dual fuel. You know, I'm gonna show you a little application we put together with um, a buffer tank. Thank you, Jay, but, by the way, for that question. Yeah, yeah, I like to. Just, I like to when you're thinking. I have the mic open, just to be clear, there are three handouts now, uh, or three files now in your handouts. Okay. Perfect. Appreciate it, man. Yeah, it. I mean, just to touch on that thing too, on that buffer tank. You know, typically when we do something like that, it's you know we're just charging a battery, right? So usually the boiler has no idea that there's something hooked up to the system. So when you've got micro loads or smaller zones like that, you know, a lot of the times they might not pull enough energy out of that buffer tank to engage the boilers. So you know, I think that's the whole purpose to like what you're saying, you know, having those buffer tanks there will limit the boilers from running. So we'll, we'll take a look at that a little more. Appreciate that one. All right. So dual fuel, we're seeing a lot more of that. 
Let me get this thing to work. There we go. You know, when we heard dual fuel in the past, you know, at least for me, you know, I always thought of oil and gas, you know, growing up, I, that's always what I heard was it was a dual fuel system. Okay, so it's it's oil. And then when it gets too expensive, we switch over to gas or it's gas. And when it gets too cold out, you know, and into the teens and 20s, we switch over, excuse me, to oil for the extra BTUs, you know. So I've always heard that. Well, now it's more... Well, I got oil and electric, or I got gas and electric, right? So we're seeing these heat pumps come in, you know, powerful heaters. So they're more than capable of doing it, and better yet, more efficient heaters. So, um, you know, why is why are we seeing that? A lot of it's rebate driven, you know, utility rebates that are out there. You know, we see some of the stuff. We had a conversation with a guy yesterday, you know, talking about strategic electrification, my favorite word. Um, you know, so you're seeing a lot more of that and what the government's demanding and asking for and reductions in carbon and all of this crap. Um, you just, we're going to see it whether we want to or not, it's happening, you know, so, you know, in order to make some of these things happen, you know, we're talking controls and wiring today, you know, they're actually putting that into the rebates. You know, you can see here for, for, um, an air source heat pump, it's got to have a dual fuel control, you know, to get that rebate. You know, yeah, it can be a great heat pump and all this other stuff and meet all these efficiency numbers and yada, yada. But if it doesn't have a dual fuel control, they don't get the rebate. You know, there's also a separate rebate for integrated controls. So homeowners can get an extra $500 per project for having an integrated control. So what is an integrated control or a dual fuel? I'm glad you asked. So integrated controls, you know, they could, for us in the Fujitsu world or, you know, what we do with heat pumps, you know, it's not really, we don't, we can go a couple different ways. We got our Wi-Fi controls. They consider that integrated. You know, why? Because like I said before, using these apps, you know, I can use an app and based off of outdoor temperature, I can shut down a heat pump and maybe, or shut down a fossil fuel device and use a heat pump or vice versa. We can do a lot of crazy things I'll show you in a little bit, but we're not going to go terribly into that. But uh, the control itself, you know, the remote control that comes with the unit that is considered an integrated control because of these things called function codes, you know, that we'll, we'll be looking at. Uh, we got this little guy here that works with third party thermostats. So this is a this is a dual fuel device. I can kind of do this echo bees out there. There's a bunch of different thermostats are dual fuel capable. So we can have multiple sources hooked up to them or stages. So we can uh, utilize what we call our thermostat converter and, and start to use third party devices as well. So, um, you know, actually 500 bucks or maybe a, a full rebate in $350 per ton, whatever that was, you know, that, that's what they're, that's what's driving it right now. You know, we can do this in a couple of different ways. We can make this a two stage system, you know, maybe a boost feature, you know, maybe we just want to utilize that heat pump as long as we can and then kind of boost it with a uh, hydronic system. You know, or backup, you know, I've, I've seen a bunch of them. We'll take a look at that as well. You know, but like I said, how do we do that? It's, it could be as simple as a remote control and a function code, you know, so that's really getting into the remote and setting a couple parameters. And, you know, really it's, it's I like that word endless because it's really is to what we can do. And it's after seeing this product roll out a couple months ago, and then working with some of the engineers uh, on how I can integrate hydronic heat and stuff like that into our Fujitsu system. I don't even need another thermostat. You know, I can do everything right from this one control, which is it's pretty cool. It's definitely cool to see and not eliminate the, uh, you know, the boiler per se. Hey, Rick. Yes, sir. Go back a slide. In theory, we could put also maybe a hydro coil. Yep. In that yep. air handler. Absolutely. In Absolutely. theory, we could have almost three stages of heat or backup or... Yeah, it could be. It could sure. be. You know, it, it, depending on what we have and what we're driving open and closed, absolutely. You know, what, what's connected to it pretty much. So, yeah, I like that. You know, I like that. You know, you can have a couple different layers, you know, a little redundancy there too. You know, and that's one of the things... I, I'll talk about that when I get up, up to here, but... You know, this is how we would wire something like that. This is a wiring class, so we've got to talk a little bit about wiring. But, you know, they give us a lot. Like I said, the flexibility and all these different outputs and inputs of these units. You know, we got two different systems. We got our electric and we got our hydronic. We got that relay with our pump, move some water to that coil. We got our heat pump, has an outdoor unit too attached to it. So 
using what we call our CN47. It's basically a, an output plug. I could take a rib relay, you know, our favorite rib relay with the light on it. Remember the light. So we're energizing a coil. So this is sending out 12 volts DC. Remember before we looked at that relay, I can do 10 to 20, uh, 10 to 30 volts AC or DC. So this guy, based on this control, you know, maybe it's an outdoor temperature driven thing. Maybe it's just the differential and temperature a set point and return temp. Um, it'll send out that signal or send out that voltage to the relay, close some contacts right to our, our switching relay and drive that pump and start moving some water to the coil. It's that simple, you know. I don't have a Nets thermostat, I don't have an Echo B, I don't have any other thermostat involved here. I don't have, you know, a couple things. You know, we'll look at hydro air a little bit more closely, but all I'm doing is putting a pump on, a coil, a rib relay to stuff I already have existing, right? So it is pretty cool to see this stuff happen now. Um, it is a little bit easier to work with, but when we start talking about all these auxiliary heaters and primary, you know, this is just a, a little taste, you know, and again, I'm sorry for the headache, but primary and auxiliary heaters, we could do anything with it, you know, just by changing a, a number. You know, you can see these numbers here. These are our function code numbers. You know, primary heater is the heat pump. Auxiliary heater is the external device. What is that external device? You tell me. You know, is that snow melt? Is that radiant? Is that baseboard, hydro coil, you know, furnace, you know, whatever it is, you know, it doesn't make a difference. You know, it could be um I'm trying to think. You're trying to think of something weird, but I can't. So we got, I think we I named enough, but you know, do we want it to be the opposite? Do I want to run that external device, you know, and then have the heat pump as my auxiliary? You know, do I want to be a hydronic, you know, to a certain outdoor temperature and I have different ways to control it by outdoor temperature and my heat pump becomes my, my auxiliary device. So, you know, there's a lot of different ways we can play with this. Um, yeah, I would say, you know, you come across the dual fuel application you want to work with, uh, you know, Fujitsu and then your hydronics, give any one of us a call, we'll be happy to help you, you know, play with that. You know, for our solar customers too, you know, gas or oil, we got a primary heat there, doesn't make a difference. Maybe we got, we have a great line with electro, we got electric backup boilers, you know, we're doing hydronics, we don't want to go to air or anything else, we want to stay with our hydronics, well, Let's pipe this on a wall and, and pipe that to our existing heating, you know, system. You know, when those electric rates are, or those solar systems are really kicking in and producing a lot of good electricity, well, maybe I run that electric boiler. You know, when it, when it gets cold at night, then I'll, I'll utilize my uh, oil heat. So, you know, whatever it is, you know, it's just uh, anything's possible. We do, this is fairly new, what would we say, Ant, maybe a year now with electro, maybe a little bit more. Yeah, I would say it's definitely close to that for sure. Yeah, it's it's cool. Time flies, man. Time flies when you have fun. But you know, these guys have been good. You know, I think they got a good product there. Um, some of the performances and the efficiencies out of these things. You know, who would have thought electric boiler? So, you know, it's definitely something that we could take a look at. Um, they have they have a whole lineup. They're nice people out there too. So yeah, yeah. So we could always do something when, when we're doing that. Um, so this is what I was saying, air to water, you know, maybe we don't want the refrigerant, you know, this is something I, I'm, I know Anthony likes this. This is something I've played with. It's an application that I put together. This is a schematic I put together for a contractor. So uh, Jay, you're talking about your buffer tank. So there she is down at the bottom here. If I can find my laser, but um, you know, air to water heat pumps with gas boiler backup and a boost feature, you know, so it boost and domestic water were taken care of. So I still got my fossil fuel device there. I got my heat pumps outside. Here's my buffer tank. You know, pretty much this left side of the system takes care of itself. The system side, everything inside the house is on its own. You know, there, there is no, with this buffer tank here, there really is no connection. You know, they kind of work independently. When I take out a certain amount of BTUs, whether it's in heating or cooling, right? These guys come on. Obviously these guys take care of all the cooling, but in the heating side, I have it wired so that when I hit a certain temperature, and we'll look at the control side of it, this is again, I put this wiring together for him. You know, he was able to take this, print it, keep it near the boiler. You know, he knows where everything goes. Definitely helped him. This, he was a first time space pack guy, first time NTI guy. So uh, first time air to water guy. So, 
this was pretty new to him. You know, he took a look at this and and it was very, very simple for him. The project is working unbelievable right now. We had a couple little snags and a couple little hiccups there, but everything's working great. So we have a main control. That's where our buffer tank comes from. Um, we got the, our boiler. So it's just a signal to our boiler. So if I can't keep up and heat that tank or, you know, whatever the case is, I will engage my boiler. You know, it's very simple. Boiler has its own circulator that's independent. Depending on heating or cooling, we're sending signals out to our heat pumps. Maybe that, that's turning them on and telling them to be in cooling or heating mode. You know, they control their own circulators, so you don't have to worry about that. But again, here's a control. You know, I talked about, let me see if I can, I don't usually do this magnification thing. It usually bites me in the ass when I do this, but we're going to try this. <clears throat> All right. Hey, so if we look at the control. Knowledge, what size buffer tank is on that project? Uh, that was a 40 gallon tank, I believe. 40 gallon, wow, okay. That's a 40 gallon, yep. So we have a couple outputs and inputs here, you know. So as you can see, these are outputs to the boiler, to the chiller, to the reversing valve. These were inputs, right? So this came from my HVAC inputs on that space pack board that we looked at before. So that's telling this control that I got a heating call on Y, uh, W, and a cooling call on Y. When that happens, it tells the relay closes on a reversing valve and drives these things into a different position. You know, I can add some more sensors here for input, outdoor air. I can add, I got relay here, I got pump here. So I got some more outputs. You know, what can I use them for? Again, this could be anything, you know, this could have been a relay. Um, maybe it went to an ERV or, you know, fresh air system for the home. So anytime this thing ran, I can, I can definitely do that. The way these controls are built, you know, a lot of them are upgradable, field upgradable for with a little USB card. You know, we call the manufacturer, tell them what we want to do. They build an update for us, send us, a, you know, an email with a file. It's, it's crazy, you know, and then just upload that to a card and plug it in. You know, it'll do it. It'll up. Might have to hit some buttons, but for the most part, it's going to do it by itself. How do we get out of it? All right. It was the first time I ever zoomed and was able to get out. Uh, the only other thing I wanted to point out here is I was talking about auxiliary. You know, we had that board. We had some auxiliary. We're going to do this again. Man. Let's see. Pushing the yeah. limits. What's that? You're pushing the limits now. <laughs> I know. I know. It's working. Couldn't get the camera working today, but everything else is. So um, so we had those auxiliary outputs here. So what I did here was just take this, run those outputs to TT terminals, or R and W on a zone control, which was EVC control, which just opened and closed the zone valve, no matter if it was heating or cooling. If you remember, I have control of using them closing a contact in heating mode or in cooling mode. Doesn't make a difference. So every time we did that, that valve closed, the pump came on, and we took water from that buffer tank and fed it to the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, fed it to that uh, air handler. So that was a lot of fun, that project. Um, there were a lot of firsts there for that guy. Um, he's definitely a believer now. He sees the uh, what air to water could do. Uh, that customer is in the middle of, I believe, doing this, some solar on the house too. So that's going to be even better, more efficient in that home. All right, moving forward. All right, so hydro air. So we're going to take a look at some. This is a big topic. I like hydro air when it's done right. I think the biggest complaint we might get is maybe some comfort, some uh, cool air areas, you know, or some drafty areas in a home. But if we do it properly, we can have a real comfortable home. It definitely cools down a little bit, but BTUs are BTUs. So what do we have? Hydro coil. We've got an air handler. we got a boiler or a hydronic system, right? So very common. We have an aquastat up at the air handler typically set to, you know, maybe 160, 170 degrees, whatever the case was at that point. That's where typically you'd find them or 140, 150. Depends on who the guy was and what their knowledge was. And they would just set them all over the place. And, and when we hooked up that pump, moved some water up to that coil. When we hit temperature, that blower would come on. You know, when we look at the wiring side of this, you know, again, here's my sequence. Call for heat, circulator moves hot water, aquastat makes and a blower comes on. It was pretty simple. You know, there were a lot of hydronic guys. They wouldn't go up in the air uh, in the attic to go work on one of these systems. But, you know, this is what a lot of common parts and pieces we would see. I don't think they had nest thermostats back then when I was doing it. And, you know, they're probably T87 Mercury guys. But, you know, we'd send 24 volts to a thermostat when we needed heat. And we sent it back up to W. From there, we energized with W in common. So that was our 24 volts in common coming from W and C. 
to a coil in this multi-purpose relay. Get that laser back right here. So there's our coil side. When we energize that coil, obviously something happens. Contacts opens, contacts close, depending on the configuration. In this case, they close. They go down to TT on our zone control, which drives that pump on, starts sending that water up. And again, once we hit that temperature at the aquastat and it makes, we energize that blower, depending on the speed we are on, we heat the home, right? So not the most efficient, but probably the most common when we talk about the uh, hydro air system could get a little messy. And I think that's what kind of scared a lot of guys. I remember guys that refused to go look or didn't want to understand what they were doing with a relay. You know, you'd see these, I've seen these, you know, just screwed to the top of air handlers up in attics. Some just laying on top of air handlers and attics, you know, maybe at the boiler, there was a bunch of these guys or in a mechanical room, but you know, the hard part with these is there was no identification. You know, you didn't know what they were doing. It was just low voltage wires hooked up to a relay. You know, nobody knew what what air handler or what 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 it was actually controlling. So yeah, it could get confusing, and that's why we kind of cleaned it up a little bit, I would say. And we offered this HAFC, which we saw in the beginning here, our hydro air fan control. You know, this thing has a lot of great features. You know, this maybe can this will be down in a boiler room. Doesn't have to be up in an attic. This will be down in a boiler room. We got some thermostat connections, so we can run our thermostat down to the boiler room. We got some aquastats we can hook up, so we can have one at the water cooler. We have, can have two of them up there, so we can have one that monitors our temperature, which drives the fan, and then the other one can be there for freeze protection. You know, that attic gets so cold, maybe we want to turn that pump on and just start to move some water so we don't freeze. Maybe that prevents us from putting glycol in the system. You know, we get some freeze protection built in there by movement. Um, then we got our pump and our boiler outputs. So these are dry contacts. Again, just pay attention to our amp ratings, right? So we got five amps or one sixth horsepower rated. So I can drive my circulator and then I can also send a signal to my boiler or a switching relay, whatever the case is, we can send a, a signal there. So we play nice with the boiler and it at least knows we got something going on. From there, we have our air handler wiring. So this could go from the control here up to our attic. That's gonna let this unit know I got a cooling call or a heating call. You can see we got a, uh, two different G terminals, a low and a high. So we might have two different blower speeds, outdoor wiring, and our this would be, represent our air handler. So again, we got lights on here to let us know if we got a heating call or if we have a cooling or heating fan call. So again, lights, as soon as you put lights on something, you sold me, I'm good, I'm, I, I'm buying it. Um, but we also have some dip switches there, you know, so we don't need, maybe if this is older air handler, a lot of our air handlers today have built in fan, uh, fan delays with fan timers. You know, this control kind of takes care of that too. We can add an additional timer to it uh, or delay, or if we didn't have the time delay, we can utilize this control 100% for that. We can also exercise that pump. So over the summer months when we're not operating, we don't want that pump to sit there dry and not moving. We can kind of exercise it and we have different um, 30 second intervals every two weeks. So we can do it for two minutes every uh, 24 hours. So not enough to drive the blower on and get heat up there, but just enough to move some water. So we know things are fresh and ready to go come the winter months. I like that control. So again, like I said, we, we had the common system. We had the, um, we had the pump, we got the Aquastat, we got the hydro air control. You know, can we make this more efficient? And the question or the answer, I gave you the question, the answer is yes. You know, this pump that you're seeing that I keep throwing on here, this Takeo VT pump, it's probably one of my favorite pumps. And I think it's probably the best application is, is hydro air. And we don't see it being used for that. So maybe after today, if this is the one thing you pick up, you know, if I get rid of that Aquastat, right, this pump comes with two sensors in a box. Typically, those sensors go on our supply and our return pipe. We monitor a delta T. So this is a VT pump, a delta T pump, right? That's what we named it. That's what it's everybody's known it as. So this pump will ramp up and ramp down to maintain a delta T that we set. If I want a 20 degree differential, that pump's going to maintain 20 degree differential based on those sensor positions. Well, the pump itself or the sensor doesn't know whether it's sensing air or if it's sensing water it's just sensing temperature so if i took that sensor now and used one of them 
and put that one sensor in the airstream, right? So we run a wire, two wire up into our air handler, and in the supply duct, I put that sensor, right? So now I'm sensing airflow. I'm not sensing a pipe. Uh, this pump also has a what we call um, a set point mode. So I can dial this in. Remember, we got rid of the aquastat. So now we got to control. We got to get something for temperature, right? So I want to set it for 140 degree air. I want 140 degree air coming out of that air handler at all times, right? I don't want the cycling. I want 140 degrees all the time. So what's going to happen? That pump is now going to ramp up and ramp down and provide the temperature of water needed in that coil to maintain 140 degree water or 440 degree air, excuse me. So, you know, we talk about efficiency and yeah, we could still use the control, right? The control's still there, our pump outputs are here. So we're just powering that pump. As long as there's a heat call, right? This guy's gonna be on, but we're now driving that that air temperature just from, you know, this pump and just the input. You know, we, we could use that second sensor and put it on a return. And it'll actually, if we had a cast iron boiler, it'll work as a boiler protection as well. You know, so it'll set, we can have, uh, I think I have a slide coming up uh, as we're wrapping up here, getting close to eight o'clock. So I'm pretty much on target. Um, but his pump, here you go, these are different modes. So if I put it my set point heating, I can go from 50 to 220 degrees with boiler protection option. So if I have it on boiler protection, you know, at less than 140 degrees, this pump's gonna kind of slow down and stop delivering that cold water back to the boiler. So let's that boiler catch up, especially with a, a cast iron boiler. I think this pump is awesome for that because it's just going to sit there and, you know, slow down, let that boiler catch up real quick and, and not shock it. You know, at the same time, still delivering some BTUs up to the, our source, you know, and maintaining those temperatures. So um, this is a cool little product. You know, it's something that we've had out there for quite some time. What model pump, Raymond? Awesome. Yep, VT. So it's a VT2218. So it's been out there for a few years now, you know, I got to say, but, you know, those are just some of those, some of those applications, you know, again, open your mind a little bit. Where can I use this? You know, I, I like this with zone valves. I like this with everything pretty much. I mean, this is the, uh, the second gen new and improved um, Bumblebee. Yeah. Right. Right. I think the, the first gen what, had the Bumblebee on it. Not anymore. They took that off, but um, yeah. The Bumblebee has flew the coop, but uh, the Bumblebee was the first truly ECM and Delta T, and now this was that uh, next gen improvement over yeah, that. Right. right. So you know, this was a little shorter than most of you. What are we at? Just about eight o'clock. So this worked out great. Um, but like I said, this was more to open your guys' minds. You know, think about some of the controls you're dealing with every day the signals, switches, you know, maybe there's some jobs you're thinking about today that, you know, you're trying to figure out how to control something or customer has something they want, you know, they have, they have, you know, I don't know. Yeah, we get all these weird applications, you know, that come through, I think every year, there's a, at least a half dozen, a dozen weird things that we're, we're trying to do with our heating and, and cooling systems. You know, a lot of the controls that we provide, you know, right from the manufacturer, are more than capable of doing a lot of this stuff. We're just not aware of what they are. Um, so that's really the purpose of this training. You know, Rick, this open up at, your mind a little bit. And we got look a at Jacob's question here. Yep. What we got asking uh, if you can use the two sensors of the delta T. Of course you can. Or is it better to put that set point mode on and use a single sensor? Um, it depends you know, on the application. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say, when you're going from water to air, we have our issues with pumping and piping and making sure all things are lined up. But then the same thing applies on the blower sizing and also duct work. So, yeah. you know, I do like making problems going away where we do make it a set point. So I know I'm guaranteeing not a cool coil on, on startup or an overheating coil. And, you know, you're not you're delivering comfort anymore. So it really flattens that um, that comfort curve when we can do it at set point. You have to figure out is that 140 the magic number for air temperature for the for everything to deliver yeah. to the space. But um, you know that's kind of easily we can figure it out in a couple of switches of a set point on the pump. So yeah, 
Yeah, you're not climbing through an attic, you know. I would I would say, you know, is it better? You know, I don't know really to say it's better. I think it's going to I think you said it perfect. You know, it's going to flatten that comfort curve. You know, you think about how a hydro air system would work, you know, even when we talk about cast iron boilers. I remember, you know, you get it running for the first time, we dump a lot of cold air uh, cold water back into the boiler. Remember those pipes are in an attic that are most likely unconditioned. So that water comes back. Those cast iron boilers if it had a triple aquastat or something like that, it would show it up as zoning circs when it dropped below 160 degrees in a boiler, right? So now you got to wait for the boiler to heat back up again. Then while you're waiting, the homeowner, the blower might be the blowing cold air or not even running yet because it's not up to temperature. You got to wait for the boiler to heat up. And you kind of had this back and forth game until we had enough steady temperature coming back to the boiler to keep it running nonstop. You know, where this it's almost the boiler the pump's going to protect both you know it's going to keep the steady air temp it's going to keep the steady water temp so the boiler keeps doing its thing you know and i think it's just i think flattening the comfort curve is the perfect term for that um that's why i, I really like that set point what we do classes uh michael yeah we you know that's a good question you know electric boilers is something that we definitely have to look at you know it's a product line new to us you know we, we got to get a better understanding of we've I know commercially we've used a couple of these, so we're definitely going to take a peek at that. Um, you know, but yeah, it's definitely a possibility. We'll, we'll definitely be doing that stuff. Um, Pat, thanks for the good words. We just yeah, want to finish you. up here with some uh, just some finishing slides here. If you guys you know are not aware, all the webinars that we have done already are already posted on our HVAC Insiders. You know, by probably 10 o'clock, I wouldn't be surprised if our marketing team had this. You know, they're, they're pretty quick with this. You know, at least give them a day. But um, they're pretty quick and they get our videos right on there. So these trainings are available right there on HVAC Insiders. Um, you have full access to all of that stuff. You're also going to find a we've added to a training schedule. You can see here we got the webinars, the training schedule. So you're going to see our what's coming up you know our upcoming live webinars we got a lot of stuff you know in a hopper right now a lot of stuff coming uh we finish april 7th with this series and then we kick it off right again you know we got a couple things going so we will be continuing on with some other classes um raymond absolutely you know we can do you know whatever you guys that's this is the purpose of doing this we want to see and that's how this class was really born was we had you guys reaching out like you are now can you do radiant classes can you do electric boiler and that's what it was, you know, we kind of create these so you guys can, you know, get the information you need. We can definitely do the Radiant. I think uh, Jim's already done a Radiant class, so we might even be able to find that on the HVAC Insiders, but it's definitely something we can do again. Um, you can see coming up next week, we've got some venting, condensing boilers. Uh, the week after, we're doing all about tankless, so we'll talk about some gas and electric tankless products. And then I'll be wrapping it up on the 7th with some Fujitsu troubleshooting and resources. So that, that'll be fun. Um, again, we got a lot of other classes coming up. So if you haven't signed up for them, I'm sure you get any emails. You can you, you can go right to the website as well, HVAC Insiders, to get all signed up. Um, if there's any other questions, you know, please throw them in the chat. We appreciate you guys. There's my, my contact info as well as Anthony's. Got some emails there. If you want to take a screenshot, a picture of that. Thank you. Um, the guys uh, kind of saying thank yep. you. Great class. Appreciate and, uh, that. Yeah, I didn't yeah. know what this was going to be. You know, we figured we'd have some fun with it. You know, we always have. I love thinking. You know, <laughs> I'm always thinking. You know, it was some of those schematics. You know, it was 1030 at night sending emails to engineers at Fujitsu doing some brainstorming. You know, it's, uh, it's fun. It's fun when you can kind of solve some problems. All right, so I don't see any other questions. So no, I think everyone's kind of being yeah. kind, good words yeah. leaving, or certainly um, reach out to us if you have any questions. And absolutely, have a great day. Yeah, have a happy St. Patrick's Day. I got to go throw my corned beef in a smoker, man. There you go. Yeah, go. All right, guys. I just want to say thank you, and uh, we'll see you next week.